Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this incredibly important discussion. We're really thrilled you could join us. Uh, National Council of Jewish Women Victoria would like to acknowledge the Boomerang people and the Wirrindigi people of the Kulin Nations and all the traditional owners of the land that is Australia. We recognise the traditional owners continuing connection to the land, waterways and community. We pay respect to the elders past and present and we acknowledge their stories, traditions and living cultures. As Jewish women, we specifically honour and acknowledge the First Nations women who, like our matriarchs, are strong, brave, determined and resilient. So on June 24th of this year, the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v Wade ruling of 1973. We really saw an uptake on social media, even prior to this ruling, even when the document was leaked that it was actually going to happen. We, we really got a huge uptake from the community asking us how this is going to impact the women in Australia, what we can do to help. And so we are very, very lucky to have tonight Dr. Ronley Sifres, who is able to give us an incredible amount of insight and education around this topic. So Ron Lee is a senior lecturer at Monash University's Faculty of Law and the deputy director of the Caston Centre of Human Rights Law. Her research is predominantly focused on issues at the intersection of women's reproductive health and the law at both domestic and international level. This includes abortion, surrogacy, assisted reproduction and involuntary sterilisation. Tonight, leading the conversation is the chair of the Advocacy Committee of National Council of Jewish Women Australia, Victoria, Rebecca Forgaz. Rebecca is also a board member and a lifelong feminist. She is the bearer of a master's degree in women's studies and Jewish studies and is deeply committed to gender equity within and beyond the Jewish community. So, Again, Ron Lee, I thank you for joining us and your time this evening. And Rebecca, I will pass things over to you. Thanks very much, Lisa, for that introduction. And welcome again, everyone, and welcome, Ron Lee. Um, it's great to be having this conversation this evening with you tonight. Um, I wanted to add just a little bit to Lisa's um, introduction about why National Council is doing this event tonight. Um, National Council is, of course, a women's organisation, an Australian women's organisation, and specifically, of course, a Jewish women's organisation. Um, and, for, you know, obviously this issue when it um, happened, this uh, monumental decision that happened in the United States, I think had repercussions for women all over the world. Um, it really caused women all over the world to um, a great deal of distress and concern. Um, and so, you know, it, it was just a, an, an issue of international significance. So as a women's organisation, we felt it was something important to address. Um, as an Australian women's organisation, I think a lot of women in Australia have been asking questions about what this decision means for us here in Australia, if anything, are there any implications? And it gave us all pause to actually revisit and ask the question, what actually is the legal status of abortion in Australia? And could anything like what happened in the United States happen here? And then finally, the Jewish aspect. Um, some of you may be aware that um, for our sister organisations in the United States, the National Council of Jewish Women and other Jewish women's organisations, um, reproductive rights has been a key advocacy issue for many decades, in fact. And when this decision was made, they've been part of the um, movement and the protests um, against the decision and will be continuing their advocacy work on this issue for, for many months and years to come, I'm sure. So we stand with them on that issue um, as here as uh, a sister organisation in Australia. Um, but also there is a specifically Jewish angle on this issue, which we'll be looking at a little bit later in that the Jewish legal approach in halakha to um, abortion actually stands in some sense in conflict with some of the most extreme anti-abortion laws that um, have now come into effect in America. And that's a really interesting thing that we're going to talk a little bit more about later. Um, I did want to also just say a few words about my own personal interest and sort of background and connection to the Roe versus Wade case. Um, 
I, as Lisa sort of mentioned in the introduction, I've been a feminist as, as long as I can remember, always back to when I was at school, I considered myself a feminist. And I remember it was either in high school or my early years of university, I remember watching movies about the Roe versus Wade case. It was sort of part of my feminist education. Um, and um, one of them must have been a, a made-for-TV movie starring um, Holly Hunter and Amy Madigan, which I just looked up to remember what it was. Um, and I remember being really very moved by, by learning about um, the Roe versus Wade case. And it really became something that stood out as a really iconic emblem of the women's rights movement. Um, and nothing I ever imagined could be wound back um, to the kind of horrific conditions that women had to endure when, when abortion was not legal. So I was really personally very shocked and, and distressed when I found out earlier this year when, when the leaked document about the possibility of this decision happening came out. Um, and I'm really um, pleased and privileged to have this opportunity to engage in this conversation tonight with Ron Lee, who is really an expert in, in this issue here in Australia. Um, so, so I thought I might actually just start, Ronley, by asking you um, how you became interested in the issue of uh, women's reproductive health and the law specifically, and how this sort of came to be your area of expertise. Thanks, Rebecca, and uh, good evening to everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us. And um, thank you especially to the National Council of Jewish Women for inviting me um, to talk about this really important issue. I'm so thrilled that um, this event is taking place, uh, so thank you. Um, I also just wanted to reiterate um, Lisa's acknowledgement of the country and um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm coming to you from. That's the um, Bunuran people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respect to uh, elders past and present. Um, so to answer your question, Rebecca, I, I think um, like you, I've been a lifelong feminist. Um, my uh, background is in international human rights. Um, and so when I came, when I decided to do a PhD, I knew it was going to, going to be in something to do with international human rights and probably uh, women's rights because I, I've been interested in women's rights forever. Um, and I, I came across someone who was doing a PhD looking at, at domestic violence through the prism of torture. And that uh, idea really intrigued me because um, through talking to her, I realised that torture is something which, like most law, has been framed by men for men. So when we think about what torture is, we think about it in that sort of traditional form of, you know, a prisoner of war being tortured in a jail cell for information about, you know, the enemy. Um, and this person was doing a PhD saying, well, there are other forms of torture too that disproportionately impact women like domestic violence. And so uh, that got me thinking about um, whether there are other issues that disproportionately affect women where, uh, where the law hasn't really taken it into account. So that's how I ended up doing my doctorate on this issue of whether restrictions on reproductive freedom could fall within uh, the international prohibition on torture or cruel inhuman or degrading treatment. So that was sort of my starting point. And then after my PhD, I got interested in um, these issues at the domestic level as well. So I've done a lot of work around uh, abortion and surrogacy and other reproductive rights issues. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that background, Ronley. So um, we're really lucky, actually. Um, we uh, came across an article, I think, that you wrote shortly after this decision, um, initially in the conversation, that I think that was picked up and, and republished elsewhere. So um, we're really thrilled with that background that you have to have you here tonight to, to discuss this issue. Um, I'm, I'm going to invite uh, you, Ronley, in, in a moment um, to give us a bit more of a background um, about the recent decision, sort of going back and just putting it all into context for us to get, so everyone can have a better understanding of the original Roe versus Wade case and what it was and the political and legal context of, of the more recent decision. Um, and the consequences of that decision in the United States. So 
Um, in a moment, everyone, I'll be inviting Ron Lee to actually give us a brief presentation, just so we can get that overview as that context for the conversation that will follow. Um, if people have any questions at any point um, in the evening, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A, which I'm sure by now people are familiar with at the bottom of your, um, of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to enter them there. They will be moderated. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we can, but I'll give everyone a warning that we're unlikely to be able to answer all questions, um, but please post them at any time in the Q&A box that, that they arise for you. Um, Ron Lee will be giving us about a presentation of about 15 minutes. Um, then she and I will be continuing the, the conversation between the two of us, um, and that will take us through to about the 40 to 45 minute mark, and then we will be opening it up to questions from, from everyone. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ron Lee now um, for that uh, presentation and um, background to the recent Supreme Court decision. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. Um, so I will just um, share my screen with you all um, so that you can uh, see some slides which I have pulled together on this. Okay. Um, all right, so as Rebecca said, I'm going to be talking just for about 15 minutes uh, about uh, the fact that Roe v. v. Wade has been overturned and what this actually means and what happens next. Um, but before I begin, I just want to say a word about language. Um, so this presentation is essentially about abortion. It's about people's right to access abortion and uh, what happens when that right is denied. Um, and so I think it's important to recognise that women as well as other people with uteruses like trans men or gender non-binary people uh, may become pregnant and may need to access abortions. Uh, while recognising that this is not an issue that affects women alone, uh, it does disproportionately impact women. And it is also women who have been at the forefront of the fight for reproductive rights uh, for many, many years. And so I am going to use the term women in this presentation uh, while recognising that the issues that we're discussing also impact other people and that, that their rights uh, must also be uh, respected and protected. So let's uh, begin with this famous uh, landmark US Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade. Um, the facts of this case are that in 1970, a young woman from Texas, whose name was Norma McCorvey, sued for her right to terminate a pregnancy. This is um, Norma McCorvey here in the photo, and I believe the woman next to her is actually her lawyer. Uh, she sued under the alias of Jane Roe, which is why the case became known as Roe v. Wade. Um, now, at the time um, of this case, abortion was only legal in Texas if the pregnancy presented a serious risk to the woman's life. And in this case, the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the land, uh, ruled by a 7-2 majority that the Texas law was unconstitutional. It held that the right to abortion was protected by the US Constitution, and specifically the court held that the right to privacy, which had long been viewed as forming a part of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, includes a right to choose to terminate a pregnancy. Now, this is the court that decided Roe v. Wade. Aside from noting the obvious that a decision about abortion rights was decided by a court comprising all white male judges, another really interesting point to note is that of the seven judges who formed the majority in Roe v. Wade, six were judges appointed by a Republican president. And the reason why I find that fascinating is because it illustrates the extent to which abortion has become politicised in the US in the intervening years since Roe v Wade. At the time that Roe v Wade was decided back in 1973, 
six judges appointed by a Republican president held that the US Constitution enshrined a right to abortion. Now, fast forward to Donald Trump's presidency, and we see a very explicit and determined move to appoint judges to the court who would overturn Roe v. Wade. So in the years since 1973, we've seen an issue that should be regarded as a health issue become highly politicized such that it influences who is appointed as a judge to the United States Court. Now, let's fast forward to 2022, and we have uh, the case of Dobbs and, and the Jackson Women's Health Organization. This is the court that decided the Dobbs case. It's a very different looking court to the court that decided Roe v. Wade. Here in the front row, we have Justices Alito and Thomas, both Republican appointees, both had been talking for decades about wanting to overturn Roe v. Wade. In the middle here, we have Chief Justice Roberts, also a Republican appointee. Then uh, we have in the back row, the three most recent of Trump appointees to the court. And finally, we have the three Democrat appointees to the court. Justices Kagan, Breyer and Sotomayor. And the reason why I'm making a point of whether the judges were appointed by Republican or Democratic presidents is because the decision in Dobbs split directly along these lines, once again illustrating the way that abortion has become politicised in the US, but also illustrating the fact that as much as we like to believe that law is separate from politics and that judges are neutral and impartial and so on. This decision shows us in vivid colour how the way that judges interpret the law is influenced by their own views, experiences and political persuasions. So turning to the case at hand, this case in, uh, involved a Mississippi law that banned abortions after 15 weeks gestation. Jackson Women's Health Organization, Mississippi's last remaining abortion clinic, challenged the law as constitutionally invalid on the basis that it contravened the principles established in Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court decided 6-3 to uphold the Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks gestation and it decided by a 5-4 majority to overturn Roe v. Wade. In doing so, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that there is no federal constitutional right to abortion. It is now up to the states to regulate abortion as they see it. The three Democrat appointed judges who I've circled here uh, in blue uh, dissented. They disagreed with the majority decision and they expressed the view that Roe v. Wade was good law and should stand. They said that the consequences of this decision are that from the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. A state can force her to bring a pregnancy to term, even at the steepest personal and familial costs. The three Trump appointees here circled in red in the back row, and the two other long serving Republican appointees, uh, both upheld the Mississippi law, which banned abortion post 15 weeks gestation and overturned Roe v. Wade removing constitutional protection for the right to abortion. Chief Justice Roberts in the middle here, also a Republican appointee, upheld the Mississippi law, but stopped short of overturning Roe v. Wade. This was actually of no practical significance because the majority already had the numbers to overturn Roe v. Wade, even without his vote. Following this decision, um, as uh, Rebecca mentioned in her introduction, uh, protests erupted not just in the US, 
uh, but all over the world, including here in Australia, where we saw protests taking place in every capital city in the weekend uh, following the handing down of the Dobbs decision. Um, so uh, why uh, did the entire world react in such a strong way to this decision? What are the consequences of this decision? Well, uh, the direct consequences of this decision are that there is no constitutionally protected right to abortion. Abortion regulation is a matter for the state which means that some states will retain permissive legislation, but other states will completely ban abortion. And this is in fact uh, what we have seen take place in the weeks that have followed since the Dobbs decision. I've put here on the slide a screenshot of a map uh, from the website of the Centre for Reproductive Rights. And you can actually um, go to the website. I've put the website address on the slide there and see uh, that the map that they have is actually an interactive map. And so you can hover over each state and see what the law is in each state uh, now that the Dobbs decision has come into effect. And what you will see is that um, there really is uh, in the US today, a, a tale of two countries. Those states which are color coded on this map in blue and in yellow uh, retain uh, liberal abortion laws. They retain good legal access to abortion. So if you live in New York, for example, you will still be able to access legal abortion. Same if you live in California, for example. And in fact, in the days following the Dobbs decision, the governor of California uh, came out and said that California was going to actually expand uh, its abortion legislation to protect women who may have to travel from more conservative states to California in order to access uh, abortion services. So abortion will remain um, legally accessible in um, a number of US states. But as you can see from this map, those states that are color coded red or brown have already enacted severely restrictive uh, abortion legislation. So for example, in Alabama, there is now a total ban on abortion. And in Georgia, abortion is prohibited from six weeks gestation. Six weeks is um, very early in pregnancy. Many women don't even know they're pregnant at that point. So the consequences for abortion access in the US are very serious indeed. Um, but uh, these consequent, the consequences of this decision extend uh, beyond abortion access. Uh, many doctors afraid of prosecution will stop treating women for miscarriage and even for a type of pregnancy because the treatment for miscarriage is in many instances the same as the treatment for an abortion. Um, fertility treatment may be impacted. This is particularly the case in those states which have uh, what are called fetal personhood laws where they view, particularly where they view uh, the, the fetus as a person beginning at the time of fertilization. Um, part of IVF is of, often involves the destruction of embryos, um, which will no longer be allowed in these states. So in the days following the Dobbs decision, we saw a number of fertility clinics scrambling to move their labs from more um, conservative states to more liberal states. Um, but the consequences of this decision stretch even beyond um, issues relating to reproductive health. Uh, the logic of the court's decision could equally apply to other unwritten rights which are derived uh, from the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution, like the right to contraception or the right to gay marriage. So uh, this decision has potentially far-reaching consequences uh, for the human rights of everyone who lives in the United States and possibly uh, beyond. Um, I now want to just finish up um, with a quote from the late uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, many of you will have heard of her. 
She was um, a feminist icon. She was a judge on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, she was a warrior for women's rights, including reproductive rights. And she was also a, um, a Jewish woman. And she, uh, she fought uh, valiantly to hold on to her seat on the Supreme Court because she knew that if um, she didn't hold on to it, she would be appointed, she would be replaced by a Trump um, appointee. And that would give the court the numbers to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, unfortunately, she, um, she passed away um, while Trump was still president and she was replaced by Amy Coney Barrett on the court. Um, who did in fact give the court the numbers to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, so uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg once commented that the decision uh, whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It is a decision she must make for herself. When government controls that decision for her, she is being treated less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. Um, so on that note, um, I will uh, stop sharing my slides and hand over to Rebecca for questions. Great, thanks for that, Ron Lee. That was um, really helpful um, background, I think, for everyone. Um, I wanted to I wanted to pick up on um, actually where you just left off there with um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and actually there's a couple of questions that have just been popping into the Q and A about this issue of the um, Supreme Court's ability to interpret the Constitution and in fact some people who argued that um, Roe v Wade was never kind of fa uh, securely kind of founded as um, in, in the constitution itself. And I actually came across, there was some discussion in the US media that Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself um, had made some commentary about this herself. And, and so I think some of it quite egregiously tried to suggest that she disagreed with the court's decision to enshrine um, the right to abortion. From what I understood, what she actually argued is that it would have been preferable for abortion perhaps to have been framed as a right to equal protection under the constitution rather than um, the right to privacy. So could you elaborate a little bit on some of this conversation about that spectrum of issues? Yeah, so that's it's a really interesting point that you make because that's exactly right. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself felt that abortion, the right to abortion would have been better located within the right to equality than the right to privacy. And one of the reasons for this argument, and, and lots of people and feminists have agreed with her, uh, one of the reasons for this argument is because the, there is no explicit right to privacy in the US Constitution. So the 14th Amendment actually enshrines a right to liberty. And that right to liberty has been interpreted as including a right to personal liberty, which has been interpreted as then including a right to privacy. So it's it's kind of um, joining a few dots there. Whereas the right to equality is more explicitly referenced in the constitution. So the view was that it it, um, it would have made a more secure uh, basis, if you like, for a right to abortion. Um, and then of course, there's the view that um, that dictating a woman's right to choose when and, and, and how she has her children um, it does fundamentally impact on her ability to participate as an equal in the civil and political life of the nation. So there, is, there are very strong arguments for the equality basis for a right to abortion, which is why lots of people have sort of felt that it would have um, been a stronger basis. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, there's another question, I think, around this, this sort of, just in terms of this commentary that some people have suggested that this decision, the Dobbs decision, is not actually an anti-abortion decision per se, but rather that it's simply turning control over um, abortion laws back to the individual states where they can each make their own decision. And I think it's sort of claimed that then this is more reflective of the will of the people because the state can then... people are voting, you know, for the legislature in their in their own state. Um, could you share your thoughts about that line of argument? 
Yeah, uh, look, I think it, it's a bit of a disingenuous argument, I would say, because it, it was always very clear that the consequence of overturning Roe v. Wade wouldn't be would would in fact be what what has transpired, which is that you have huge chunks of the country enacting uh, severely restrictive bans on abortions. So. Um, the state's rights argument is, I think, really problematic in this context because uh, this, what you're essentially saying then is that um, states' rights trump fundamental human rights, and, and I think that's a, a problematic perspective. Um, just picking up there from where you've left off about this question of human rights, you've, you've just described here abortion as a human right. So it's been, it's really interesting to me because I think when we hear about the discussion about abortion in the United States, it's sort of framed as a constitutional right. Like there has to be an argument made from the constitution to allow abortion. That seems to kind of an observer like me to hear that. So obviously you're the deputy director of the Caston Centre for Human Rights, and this is very much your area. You, you, this has been your research for, for many years, as you told us um, earlier. So you, you've, you've said that abortion is a human rights issue. Um, so can you just say a little bit more about that? And if that's the case, then why doesn't that have more influence on the status of abortion in a country like the States? Why doesn't it trump the anti-abortion laws of individual states? Yeah, a big question. <laughs> um, so I, I, um, I think abortion is clearly a human rights issue. Um, the World Health Organization has categorized abortion as one of the, the safest medical procedures. And yet uh, what we know is that when abortion is, is highly restricted, like it has been now in a number of US states, when it, it, it restricting legal access to abortion doesn't make it go away. What it does is drive it underground and we see um, a proliferation of so-called backyard abortions, which are fundamentally unsafe. And so legal restrictions on abortion turn what turn what is one of the safest medical procedures into a medical procedure which poses a serious danger to uh, women's health and even their lives. Um, none of us want to go back to the times of backyard abortions where, um, where women died um, seeking to terminate their pregnancies. And so the right to life and the right to health are clearly... Um, enlivened when we're talking about abortion in this context. But even beyond those two rights, which are in a way the obvious rights, um, there, there is also, you know, that, that basic right to bodily autonomy, to bodily integrity, that basic human right for a person to choose what happens to their own body, as well as, you know, the right to equality, which we spoke about a few moments ago, because we do know that, um, uh, women's right to choose to terminate a pregnancy is directly connected to their ability to participate in society. And that is particularly the case in a country like the US, which does not have paid parental leave uh, policies, certainly not adequate ones, and doesn't have an adequate uh, childcare structure. So there is uh, very much a fundamental link between women's ability to participate as equals in society and, and their right to, um, to choose the number and spacing of their children. Yeah, there, uh, there's um, an another question about um, sort of this clash of rights that I wanted to raise with you as well. And there was actually a couple of already questions also coming up into the Q&A that sort of pick up on this about um, a, a question about have there been any legal challenges already to the laws that have been passed? So um, the particular thing that I had in mind here, and this picks up also on sort of a specific Jewish lens on, on this issue. So um, one of the really fascinating challenges, there's obviously been a huge wage of, of protest and mobilisation from activists um, since this decision, but one of the particularly interesting ones that I've read a bit about and others here might have also, um, is a challenge being posed by a rabbi in Florida who's um, suing the state of Florida over a bill that would ban abortion after 15 weeks, arguing that it infringes on religious liberty. And as I'm sure many people here tonight would be aware, um, Jewish law actually allows abortion um, under certain set circumstances, um, particularly when the mother's life and or her mental health, in fact, is at risk. 
Um, so Rabbi Barry Silva is claiming that anti-abortion laws would um, prevent Jews from being able to take action that's permitted um, under Jewish law. Um, so I was wondering what you would, what you think about this approach. Do you, do you think that there's a chance that some of the state's anti-abortion laws could be overturned on the grounds of religious freedom, which is, of course, also a human right? Um, so another big question. Um, I think it's a great argument, um, is what I would say. Um, as you point out, you know, the, the, uh, right, the right to religious liberty is actually included in the US Constitution. And it would seem that in a country which is um, uh, diverse and multicultural and where there are people belonging to lots of different religions, including Judaism, and including Islam, which I believe also um, uh, does not prohibit abortion, at least up until I think 120 days, something like that. Um, you know, you, you would think that um, there would be room for different religious practice in this space, whereas unfortunately it seems as though one particular religious viewpoint has come to dominate uh, the conversation and not just the conversation, but in effect dictate the laws of the land. So uh, that would seem to be uh, highly problematic, um, even from a, a um, a separation of church and state perspective, because you know the US is not meant to be a theocracy. Um, so I would think that the right to religious liberty, that that uh, argument as a basis for a constitutional uh, challenge um, would uh, be a, a great argument. But at the same time, I wouldn't be very optimistic mm -hmm. given the current composition of the US Supreme Court and what we've already said about the um, the, the way that it's it seems to be coloured by politics. Um, and so I think what we're seeing now is the fight really taking place at the state level. Um, and um, we've seen numerous challenges um, being uh, mounted, basically arguing that the various state constitutions protect the right to abortion. So it's, I think it's very much a, a watch this space at the moment. Mm. Mm, I think, yeah, it will be particular. I thought that was particularly fascinating. And, you know, we were talking a little bit, you know, when we were preparing for this about sort of that being quite surprising, perhaps for a lot of people for a religious leader to come out and be defending abortion, because often the religious position is, you know, seen to be sort of quite anti-abortion and to have very conservative views. So I think it's a really interesting, certainly for, you know, for Jewish people here and in the States and around the world to be watching that particular um, challenge. Um, I want to I switch now to um, maybe thinking about the Australian context. I know a lot of people here today will be interested to hear a little bit more about this and a lot of us I think have wondered, you know, are there any implications um, in Australia of, of this decision? Could it have any impact here? Could something similar happen here? Um, you know, there was a huge wave of protest um, here in Australia that arose after this decision. And in an essay in the monthly magazine um, that's just come out this month, Sarah Krasnerstein, a Melbourne-based writer and researcher who many people here may know, um, observed that these protests, she said, gestured towards the rediscovery that rights can be taken away. Um, which I think is very alarming for us all to think about. Um, so I guess maybe just to start to help us sort of unpack and understand the situation in Australia, could you just give us a bit of an overview of how abortion is actually regulated in Australia and if it's similar or different to, to the United States? Yeah, so um, interestingly, in Australia, we've never had a constitutionally protected right to abortion and abortion has always been regulated at the state level. So that really means that now the way that abortion is regulated in Australia is essentially the same as in the US. Each state uh, regulates abortion as it sees fit. Um, but thankfully, our political, social, cultural context around this issue is very different. Um, and abortion has not been politicized here in the same way as it has been uh, in the US. And in fact, what we've seen happen in Australia is that um, Australia has really followed the trend of most of the Western world, the US aside, which is that of um, gradual liberalization of abortion laws. So uh, beginning with Victoria as the first state in 2008, which decriminalized abortion, we then saw a wave of decriminalization uh, sweeping across the country such that now uh, abortion has pretty much uh, in practical terms, 
been decriminalised in every um, Australian jurisdiction. Um, that said, you know, just as you know, just as the laws were changed one way, they could be changed the other way. So there is certainly um, always reason to remain vigilant and to keep, you know, advocating in this area. But I don't think there's a need to be alarmed at this stage. There's no indication that Australia is going to sort of go the same way as the US in the near future. But, um, you know, I said be alert, not alarmed. <laughs> yeah. So on, on that, it was interesting, I read uh, a little, a few weeks ago, um, last month, that the Federal Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher, and the Social Services Minister, Amanda Rishworth, um, hosted a forum for the women's ministers from all the states and territories. And one of the things that they discussed was the possibility of a national approach to safeguard abortion. I think they were sort of just canvassing views. That I don't think there was any concrete proposal at this stage, from what I understand. Um, so, you know, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that some Something worth pursuing? Is that an issue in terms of our ongoing advocacy and staying vigilant? Is that something that we should be thinking about and pursuing, do you think? Um, look, I think um, having a national approach where there's sort of consistency between the states is not, not a bad idea. I mean, at the moment, um, we do have differences between the different states. So, for example, um, in Victoria, abortion on request is legally permissible up to 24 weeks gestation. But in Tasmania, abortion on request is only legally permissible up to 16 weeks gestation. So that's quite a big difference between the, the different states. Um, so uh, having a more consistent national approach is certainly not a bad thing. But in terms of advocacy efforts, I would say that the, um, the, the laws are pretty good now. So advocacy really needs to focus on the non-legal impediments to abortion access. So things like financial impediments to access are really a big deal. Um, abortion is by and large provided in the public, in, in the private, sorry, space, not the public space. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about whether the funding of public hospitals should be tied to their willingness to provide abortion services. Currently, they're not. So mm. none of the Catholic hospitals, for example, provide abortion services, even though they get government money. Um, and so um, there is a, a lot of attention, I think, uh, that needs to be directed at the financial aspect, um, mm. at, you know, the financial impediments to abortion access. And then there's also the issue of the, the so-called postcode lottery, the fact that, um, you know, if you live in Melbourne or Sydney, it's, it's not very hard to access abortion. But, you know, in some country towns, it can be really difficult, particularly if there's, you know, one doctor in town and that doctor happens to have a conscientious objection to abortion. Mm. Yeah, I was right. Look, I'd, I would definitely recommend to everyone here if you haven't already had a look at that essay in in the monthly this month because um, a lot of the discussion there, um, Sarah Krasnerstein spoke to uh, a number of different people in this area, but one was even um, someone involved in medical education, and I think saying that abortion is still not part of kind of general practice education. It's not seen as just the sort of suite of kind of primary health care that you know, GPs can be supporting and providing. And there's still, in fact, quite a lot of stigma in the medical profession around um, the provision of abortion. So, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And not, not only that, but, um, you know, GPs can um, prescribe medical abortion up mm -hmm. to, a, you know, a certain stage of gestation. They can provide tablets uh, to bring about um, an abortion, but they have to actually undergo special training mm -hmm. to do so which is problematic too, because most GPs don't want to undergo that training. So, you know, you don't have to undergo special training to prescribe insulin to diabetics, but you have to undergo special training to prescribe abortion medication. So that also is something which um, limits access and adds to stigma. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, look, I think we're going to open up to, um, that's probably all the questions I had sort of prepared, Ron Lee, I think, and there are some questions, quite a few that have popped into the Q&A. Um, so I might turn over to some of those. There have been a few questions about the recent decision in Kansas, um, which I think has been quite surprising um, to some people because it's quite a conservative state. Um, but the decision there, and so I'm just browsing through the questions, but Ron Lee, you're probably aware of that um, 
question where, where they've enshrined the right to abortion in their constitution, I think the decision was, which was sort of surprising. You, what was your sort of reflection on, on that decision? And yeah, me, so that's sort wrong. of just broken the last couple of days where a referendum was put to the people of Kansas about whether they wanted to remove the right to abortion from the constitution. And they resoundingly voted no, they voted to keep it in there. Mm -hmm. And so it is really interesting because as you say, Kansas is uh, one of the more conservative states. And yet when the matter was put to the people, the people voted in favour of retaining a right to abortion. So it, this, it would seem to suggest that there might also be a, a disconnect between um, the really sort of powerful um, anti-choice lobby and the, the general population. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I've got another question here about, um, this is a quite so a sort of legal question about the um, uh, your views about the separation of the um, legisl legislature and the judiciary in the States, I think. And the question is how much power should courts have to interpret in such a manner as um, uh, Nina, who's asking the question, in such a manner as to be verging on legislating. I'm distressingly aware of the ramifications of the Dobbs case, but also concerned about judicial interpretation. Um, so would, could you comment on that? Oh, so I, I think um, it, it's, it's a tough question because um, we all know that in theory, the role of judges is not to make law. That is the role of parliament. Um, the role of judges is to interpret the law as um, parliament intended it to be interpreted. But of course, there's always uh, room for an element of subjectivity when that uh, judicial interpretation of the law takes place. And that's where you know uh, judges' own personal backgrounds and experiences almost always come into play. Um, there's this really, there's a really interesting Australian High Court decision, which I always teach when I teach constitutional law. And it's a really interesting decision because um, in this decision, and it, it almost doesn't matter what it was about, it, it was an unusual circumstance where there were only six judges on the High Court. Normally there's an odd number so that you get a clear majority. In this case, there were only six. And it also happened that in this case, it was three male judges and three female judges. And the decision split directly along gender lines. And a lot was written about this particular case um, because it seemed to be a clear example of the way that judges' personal experiences in life often come through in the way that they interpret the law. So I think, um, it, I mean, I know I haven't really answered the question, but it's um, it's almost inevitable that there is a level of um, of subjectivity in any um, interpreting exercise. Mm. Um, another question uh, that's come up that's interesting. We've talked a little bit about um, Australia and abortion and you've sort of said you you don't think we need to be overly concerned that we might go down that path but can you share your thoughts about what the broader this is a question from another Rebecca in the audience um uh, share your thoughts about what the broader implications might be outside of the US and elsewhere in the world other than Australia if any um, so, look, I think we have seen this kind of global trend towards uh, liberalisation of abortion laws and the US uh, with this decision is very much um, going against that global trend. Um, but, of course, the US does have significant, um, you know, influence beyond its own borders. Um, and we have seen that in the abortion context in Australia. So, for example... There's, um, there's a movement called the Helpers of God's Precious Infants, which um, was started in the US. And they're the people who were very uh, vocal protesters outside of abortion clinics, you know, picketing and holding up the models of fetuses and those horrible um, posters and so on. Um, that was a very strong US movement, which then sprung kind of satellite groups in Australia. And we started then also seeing um, members of the Helpers of God's Precious Infants protesting outside Australian abortion clinics. Now, thankfully, we don't have that anymore because every jurisdiction in Australia has passed what are known as uh, safe access zone laws. So uh, nobody can actually pick it within 150 metres of an abortion clinic. 
Um, but that is a, a very clear example of the way that a kind of movement which started in the US was picked up in Australia and in other parts of the world. So uh, certainly um, there is um, there is reason to remain vigilant um, post the Dobbs decision to sort of watch and see um, how things are developing and whether we're seeing the, the exporting of, of any um, sort of groups or issues or things of concern mm. here. Mm. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, Ronley, about some of the other kind of uh, flow on effects beyond just abortion laws that this decision could have. Um, so there was a question here from Kalia, I think it was, which was how does the um, overturning of Roe v Wade implicate access to contraception and other basic reproductive health care? Yeah, so um, the right to contraception was also ground, it, it, it also stemmed from a Supreme Court decision. So in the same way as the right to abortion came out of the US Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, the right to abortion came out of a US Supreme Court decision called Griswold. And um, it was based on the same reasoning as the right to abortion. So it was also founded on this right to privacy, which was drawn from the right to liberty in the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. So the, uh, the um, reason why people are so worried is because if what the US Supreme Court is saying is that there's no right to abortion because abortion's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. Well, by that same reasoning, they can say, well, there's no right to contraception because the right to contraception is not explicitly mentioned in the US Constitution. Um, and, and in fact, we're seeing, I read an article the other day about the fact that there's been a significant uptake in, in vasectomies taking place in um, conservative states because there is a real fear that the next case to come before the Supreme Court will be um, a, a case on the right to contraception. Right. Um, there's one more question here. Um, uh, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. One um, is from Nicole, um, which is if the um, USA had ratified, and there's a couple of um, uh, acronyms in here that I'm uh, looking up. So if the US had ratified the Committee on the Elimination um, can, or convention, I think, on the elimination of discrimination against women, would that have had an impact on the court's decision, do you think? And has there been pressure from the Human Rights Committee to require the United States to meet its obligations under the International Covenant on Civic, civic um, Civil and Political Rights? Yeah, so I, I don't think it, it would have made a difference because um, the US... It, is what's known as a dualist country, which basically means that it, international law is not automatically a part of US domestic law. So um, where it, while it is kind of a, a good faith, I guess, thing that, you know, if you ratify a treaty, you should comply with its terms, they don't technically actually have to buy US domestic law. So um, then they wouldn't have been bound by that. So I don't think it would have made um, a difference to, to the actual decision. Um, as to whether there, there's been any um, comments, to be perfectly honest, I, I would have to go back and read the um, some of the, um, the committee's actual sort of uh, concluding observations on the US. I can't remember off the top of my head whether um, it said anything to, um, to condemn their approach to these issues or not. So... I'm sorry, I can't give a good answer on that one. No worries. So I think I think this will be the last question. Um, earlier, we were talking a little bit about that one specific challenge that's come from a rabbi in Florida to um, some of these laws. Just more broadly, though, where do you think in the United States and more broadly, if you like, but particularly in the United States, I think in the wake of this decision, where do you think the um, fight for reproductive rights is going next? And what kind of strategies do you think might be taken up by sort of pro-choice lawyers and activists who are trying to sort of limit the damage that might be done um, by this decision? Um, so I think, first of all, um, it's going to the state courts. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, challenges, um, to in, in particularly particularly in the really conservative states which have enacted highly restricted abortion laws, there are challenges already on foot on the basis that those laws contravene the state constitutions. 
Um, we're also seeing um, attempts by the federal government to do what it can, which really isn't very much in this space, but we saw just um, in the last few days, uh, President Biden saying that he was going to uh, expand um, Medicaid access so that um, women who are needing to travel to another state can access um, financial support uh, for that. So um, we're seeing sort of, um, I guess, the fight happening at different levels and in different forms. And then, of course, there probably will be challenges going up to the US Supreme Court as well, for example, based on uh, the religious liberty ground that we were talking about earlier, although um, I wouldn't be overly optimistic as to um, how successful they would be. Mm. Ronley, thank you very much. I, I, I feel like I shouldn't really, but I did feel that I need to just sneak in one last question. Which how do you personally feel about the future direction of this issue? Do you feel optimistic or is this sort of a devastating blow from your perspective? I, for me, this is a devastating blow, um, and I particularly feel for those women who are who are especially vulnerable, who are already in positions of significant disadvantage, because that's who this is going to hit the most. You know, someone like me living in Oklahoma would be able to travel to New York to access the care that I required, but who this decision is really going to hit is. Um, you know, people on, on low incomes who can't afford to travel, uh, victims of domestic violence who can't, uh, who wouldn't be able to escape the perpetrators long enough to get to another state to access abortion, single mums who can't get um, childcare for their existing children to enable them to go uh, interstate. So uh, this decision is really going to hit the people who can least afford to take the hit. Um, so I, I think it's it's absolutely devastating. Mm. Well, sorry to sadly to be finishing. Yeah, sorry to leave note, on that note. But I think it is a great call for us to all do to at least stay aware and stay keep ourselves educated about what's happening and do whatever we can in this part of the world to support and, as you say, sort of remain vigilant here in Australia as well. So, Ronley, it's been an absolute um, privilege to have this conversation with you this evening. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to park, pass back over to Lisa Ezekiel, our CEO, to close the evening. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, really, um, you really shed some incredible light onto this issue Ronley, and we are really so grateful for your time tonight. I know there was a lot of confusion around this issue, the implications it was going to have for us in Australia, and you really have um, unpacked that for us in a really simple way. And um, I don't know about anyone else, not sure I'm going to be able to sleep tonight, to be perfectly honest. It's really, um, as you pointed out when you finished, it is terrifying that the women that need it most are not going to be able to access abortions yeah we are we are lucky to be where we are so on that note we actually have a fundraiser to support these women in america um with our sister um organization we have these lovely bags i'm hoping they come around the route right well no gonna have to take my background off one second um we have these tote bags that we have created that say girls just want to have fundamental rights here we go no background choose your virtual background none all right now you can see me just in the office so we have these girls just want to have fundamental rights we are raising money for um access abortion together with the national council in america to ensure that there is a fund for women who want to or need to um get an abortion and um don't have the funds to get to another state as um ron lee talked about we really thank you all for being here today and making sure that this is a really, is at the forefront of our minds. And, and with, as Ron Lee very adequately put was we need to stay um, aware of this issue because just like it, they didn't expect it to happen in America, it is, it is definitely not off the cards for the rest of the world. So thanks everybody. We've got another event next Tuesday, which I'd love to see you all at our Minna Fink lecture with Jackie Felgate,
who will be in conversation with Dina Rosendorf. Um, if not, we'll see you at the next one. So thank you so much for joining us and supporting National Council.